Thank you for listening to the Because and Effect podcast. My name is Nolan Bicknell, and I'm joined via Zoom by Adam Glenn. He's the station manager at 93.7 CJNU on all your radio dials in Winnipeg, maybe a little bit outside of Winnipeg, but uh, CJNU is the nostalgia radio station in our city, and it is one of the only community radio stations going. Adam, station manager, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Nolan. I, I, I always say anytime I get to sit in an interview environment, with somebody and I'm not having to ask the questions. It's the best thing ever. You can just sit back and, and enjoy the ride. I'll do all the work. I'll do all the heavy lifting. But well, I mean, you'll be doing most of the talking, but uh, <laughs> oh dear, you're a professional talker, so you should be all right. Maybe before we get into CJ and you and everything that, that's, that, that you guys are up to, maybe tell me about how the last two years have been uh, pandemic wise. Like how did that change your day to day? How did it change the station? How did it change how you, you, you know, recorded from home? I'm sure, but just take me back to when it first started. What was that like for for you and your team and, and what what is it like now? So interestingly, March 12th, 2020 was the day that the WHO declared COVID-19 as a pandemic. Uh, that happens to be my wife's birthday. Mm. And she happened to be just coming back from a business trip from Calgary. So she got back that evening. We went and had a very romantic meal in a mall food court. And we were trying to figure out, oh, I wonder how this is going to affect life. Little did we know what was going to come. She then several days later discovered, oh yeah, by the way, you may have been a close contact on the flight back from Calgary. So she had to go through the testing process and everything else. I think it was uh, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, where pretty quickly everyone realized, okay, we're going to be closing things down and we don't know what's going to happen next. But my... My general approach to any situation is pragmatism. It's not about worrying if we can do it or how we can do it. It's let's just find a way and get it done. Mm -hmm. So CJNU is somewhat unique in the way that we broadcast in normal times in that we have a portable radio studio that we move to different places around the community. So at the time of the start of the pandemic, we happened to be at the Kildonan Place Mall. We talked to the folks there to see what they were going to do. They had no idea. They were pretty sure they were going to be closing down as well. I went over and I chatted with a couple of our volunteers that were broadcasting there. And they were worried, thinking, oh, no, I love doing this. I don't want to stop doing this. What are we going to do? And my first thought, honestly, was, well, have you ever used video chat services before? And they thought about it and I said you know like have you ever done Skype with the grandkids or FaceTime or any of these you know other good video chat services are of course available um so they seemed to kind of nod and go oh yeah no we've done that before oh we did that while we were on vacation yeah no we could try that so I think in a period of 24 to 48 hours we contacted every one of our volunteers on air and off air and explained to them what was going to happen and we basically did a very quick skills audit to see who do we think is going to be capable of doing more mm -hmm. and who do we think is maybe not a technophile, but is willing to give something a go. So within that 48 hour period, we had pretty much figured this out and set up a system so that those who were a little bit more technically proficient could remotely control one of the computers in our studio and essentially run the radio station as if they were sat in the studio and that those who couldn't would be paired up with someone who could on a voice chat and a video chat and then the person who was technically proficient would be the one controlling when the microphone was on and off magic so we basically we made it work mm -hmm. and you know short of tin cans and string there will always be a way to make something work so i think when i look back now we were working about 24 hours ahead. Mm. And sometimes we, we tore apart our studio and we tore apart any equipment we had in cupboards and we loaned mm. microphones to people and we figured out, okay, well, your sound card doesn't do this here. I'll find you a USB sound card somewhere. Uh, Best Buy were very pleased to see me coming. Um, <laughs> it was just, again, we didn't want to take no for an answer and we didn't want to stop what we were doing because CJNU, like you said, it's a community radio station. And because we 
specifically target uh, a listenership that tends to be weighted towards older adults. It's a known fact that isolation is something that affects us hugely. And um, there are stats out there and there is research that has been done that says that social isolation is as damaging to your health as, you know, smoking several packs a day kind of thing. And we really didn't want to leave people isolated and without that friendly voice on the other end of the radio, because yeah. radio is a very intimate medium because you have been invited into someone's home or their kitchen or their car or wherever they are. And it's a two-way conversation. It's just, you can't always hear what the other person is saying. Mm -hmm. So you have to hope that you're getting the tone right. Yeah. But we did not want to lose that connection with people. So I think in the grand scheme of things, we lost maybe six hours of regularly scheduled programming over the entire course of the pandemic. So I look back at that and I think, wow, that was remarkable. But uh, yeah, I think it was just a little bit of sheer bloody mindedness, uh, not wanting to take no for an answer. And everyone, doesn't matter what their skill set, was so willing to give things a go. And I think that was what really carried us through. The audio was very very forgiving because they didn't know what was happening mm -hmm. we didn't know what was happening but we were so willing to just try and uh it it just kind of worked that's the spirit of cj and you to begin you know like uh, pandemic or not you just make you figure it out you make it work you set it up you plug it in you hope it goes and uh you start talking right and cj and you has always had that i mean yes it's it's geared for an older audience but it's always been this punk rock community kind of mindset <laughs> it's very true how did you get so i mean our listeners will will hear the beautiful accent that's coming out of the other end of the microphone right now. What give us a little bit of history? How did you get to Winnipeg, Manitoba? How did you get to community radio? Give me give me the give me the backstory on Mr. Adam Glenn. Okay, I'll I'll try and give you the Coles notes, which of course is something I didn't know what that was until I moved to Canada. But mm -hmm. nevertheless, uh, so I was born in London. My family are all originally from Ireland. I was the only person, and to date, as far as I know, still the only person in my family to not have been born in Ireland, wow. even though my parents both moved to England when they were young. So they both still sound as English as I do. But it's still a sticking point because, you know, the Irish are just like, ah, eh, yeah, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> Irish man with an English accent. Yeah, yeah, go on then. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I had that kind of family background and grew up in uh, the West of London. And I don't know, I just always enjoyed reading and I always enjoyed I don't want to say speaking but I enjoyed <laughs> chatting with people right if, if that makes sense yeah um I like talking to folks I like getting to know folks um I do my best to try and understand them and what they're all about so my, my earliest memory of this kind of thing was in elementary school like sitting in a class when the teacher would insist that you go around from person to person and a different person has to read from the textbook or read from whatever book it is. And people used to say to me, even at like age eight, oh, you should be a news reader. Mm. Oh, you sound good. And I'm just like, okay. <laughs> the seeds were planted. The seeds were planted. And then I look back to my childhood and remember that several of my toys were things like a Fisher Price uh, cassette recorder with a microphone on the side. Mm. And I'm thinking, oh, I guess the seeds were planted a lot earlier than I realized. I spent most of my school life thinking, mm, I think I might be a teacher. And then I went towards, mm, I think I would quite like to be a journalist. And when we did work experience, I did it at a, a print publication. I did it at a newspaper. And I really enjoyed that. But we did a visit to the Science Museum in central London. And at the time, I think it's gone now, but there was an exhibit on radio looking at the history of the medium, how it worked. And it was sponsored by one of the commercial radio stations in London. And they had set up a mini radio studio and they gave you the opportunity to go in there with your mates and do whatever. And they had sample scripts for news and they had intros and extras for songs and all this kind of thing. And at the end of it, you got a cassette tape that you took home with you. And I just thought, oh, People have been saying this to me for 15 years. Now I kind of get it. I would quite like to have a go at this. I had no idea how to start. So I just did some research. And in Canada and in the US, there's this very, very strong uh, basis of community-based radio stations and very often um, university campus or college-based radio stations. And like you said, it's punk rock, it's underground, it's a little bit, it's it's that sort of entryway into the uh, into the medium. It's almost like your gateway radio station, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> to stretch that metaphor a little bit too far. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the UK, similar but not quite the same. Community radio as a concept only really started to come about 
maybe five to 10 years before I started doing my research. But there was something that went back a lot further than that, which was radio stations based in hospitals. And this concept was, the idea was a bunch of people, often it was nerds and interested folks, and sometimes people who worked in radio for their day job, thinking, wouldn't it be nice to do something for folks who are literally stuck on a hospital ward? So this started in the 60s and has built this sort of huge um, culture in the UK of hospital radio being where lots of people in the broadcast industry get their start. You just sign up as a volunteer, you go and visit people on hospital wards, you chat with them, you find out about them, you take their song requests, and then you go down to wherever your studio is, more often than not in a basement, Mm -hmm. weirdly, Mm -hmm. and then you produce your radio show and it gets broadcast usually... It could be on AM, but local to the building only, or it could be through the internal systems that they have in the hospital or whatever. So, yeah, 2008, I started volunteering with the station that was nearest to me at a hospital called Northwick Park Hospital in West London. And, uh, yeah, I, I loved it. And I just kept throwing myself into it. And I was about to start a degree and I was going to go off to university and study history. Um. Again, for some context, small family, uh, just my mum, my aunt, her sister, and my grandma. So raised by three very strong women, which I think has uh, set me in good stead for a lot of things in life. But at this time, while I was about to head off and try and learn something new, uh, my grandmother was going through dementia. And it was a bit of a wrench for me, and I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do. And my mum said, just go for it, see what happens. So I spent about a year and a half trying to study for a degree in history. After having been one of these students in high school who was relatively academically, quote unquote, gifted and being told, oh yeah, you should do this. doesn't matter what you want to do in life, get a good degree in the humanities and you'll be set. So (laughs) when I was applying for university, I was thinking, oh, this whole radio thing I've just started getting interested in. What should I do for that? Maybe I should do English and journalism, maybe I should do film studies or media. And they said, no, 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 good degree in the humanities. Yep, yep. So I was good at history and I started this degree in history. And after a year and a half, I realized I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time, studying the wrong thing. And so I threw in the towel and moved back home and threw myself 110% into volunteering at the radio station and then tried to find a job, which at that time in London was nigh on impossible. I'm sure it's even worse now. But I spent a solid nine months looking for entry level work, even close to my field. I think in nine months, I got two interviews. One was actually, no, that's not true. I got three. One was a telephone interview. I could have been working in banking, which was where both my mother and my aunt worked. Irritatingly, they did an ongoing recruitment process by which they just interview people as they apply. And if somebody two people ahead of you in the queue meets all the criteria, tough luck, they got hired. Mm. So I was very close to getting hired to work in banking. That would have been an interesting, different career, I guess. Um, Second interview was for an office job. And they looked at my resume and they said, you're way too overqualified for this. I said, I know but I'm looking for a job and I will do it and I will do it really well. And I will take care of anything you need to do. And they said, no, I don't think we can do that to you. You'll be bored out of your mind. Wow. Um, Speaking of bored out of my mind, it was then eight months of the nine months before I got another interview and uh, that job, they, they looked at me and again, they said, you're really over. Why are you applying for this? I said, well, because I'm being told I should be applying for these kinds of jobs and I should try and get myself out there. Okay. Uh, No, I don't think you're quite the right fit. So anyway, I'm volunteering at the radio station throughout this entire period. Um, You know, I've got a lot of spare time and loving it. And one of my other volunteers there, a good friend of mine, David Reese, he happened to work in radio as his day job. He worked at an organisation that was contracted by both the BBC and most of the commercial radio stations in the UK to provide their traffic news services. Mm -hmm. So finding out about what's going on with road closures and construction and if there's been any accidents or you know railways and things like that so he said look you've been looking for a job for ages now why don't you just come to work with me and do some unpaid interning do some shadowing so I did that and they seemed to like me and they said yeah you should come back next week so I did that and then at the end of that week they said yeah yeah, yeah, you should come back again cut a demo or something so three weeks in and I'm thinking well this is fun I don't really know what I'm doing but this is fun And then the boss comes over to me and said, do you want a job? I said, what? 
turned out they needed somebody for weekends. So I started working weekends and covering every person's vacation that was humanly possible. Mm -hmm. And this was how I sort of got my foot into the industry. Did this for two years and then decided in uh, a fit of peak, I'm going to just throw everything in and move to Canada. No, not quite. But parallel to all of this happening, uh, I had been in a long distance friendship, uh, which turned into a long distance relationship with my then girlfriend, now wife, who is a Winnipegger. And we met online through a web forum when such things were still mm -hmm. very um, popular. Uh, then we both joined Twitter at the time where it was a very burgeoning social network and still fun and not quite an <laughs> echo chamber of misery like it is today sometimes. And quickly friendship turned into sort of long distance relationship when we realized that, oh, we quite like each other. And it was also interesting because when you're on a forum, usually you're behind some kind of a, a username or a pseudonym and you don't necessarily have a picture of yourself there. So on Twitter, we both happen to use our real names or we may have shared our real names and we both had a picture of each other and we kind of went oh oh i think interesting you're quite yeah and and you like uh, mm. Mm. so so this became a very very uh strange experience for me and a strange experience for Gemma. and together we just kind of kept this thing going long distance relationship weren't sure what was going to happen uh i she then came to the uk for a year she, through the U of M, got to do a year on an exchange program with a university in the UK. So she moved to Plymouth, which is 300 and something miles away from London. But at the time, I was only working weekends, so I could spend five days a week with my girlfriend and then pop back home to work and then go back and see my girlfriend again. It was great. Um, so the, the relationship very quickly strengthened. She moved back to Winnipeg. I immediately booked my first flight to come and visit. I visited in summer first. And that was what, brilliant. What year was that? 2012. Okay, cool. And she said to me, look, if you're going to do this for real, you have to visit in winter because <laughs> you may not like it. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't trying to pull the wool over my eyes. Uh, although, to be honest, she probably needed to pull the wool too very tightly down mm -hmm. upon my head. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so I, I then came again in that winter just before Christmas and I liked it. I sort of immediately understood the manitoba ethic of there's no such thing as bad weather just bad clothing and the idea that once you get below minus 10 everything feels exactly the same the only difference is how quickly you'll get frostbite so i didn't mind i liked it and i thought i could genuinely see myself moving here Gemma was looking at options for moving to the uk as well but uh, immigration to the uk tends to be tougher and uh, canada had a scheme called International Experience Canada, IEC, and they would offer work permits to people who were aged between 18 and 30 from different countries that have strong historical ties to Canada. So logically, I think this was countries, especially in Europe, where a lot of the original settlers had come from and perhaps where strong migration had been from over the years. So, for instance, they offered it to folks from Ukraine and they offered it to folks from uh, the UK, obviously. Um, but being Irish, I held an Irish passport. So I had an opportunity to apply for a two year open ended work permit. So I filed the paperwork thinking that absolutely nothing would happen. And then complete joy and surprise when I then got a letter in the mail saying, yeah, congratulations, you've been accepted. You now have 12 months to figure out when you're going to first come to Canada. You can then be here for two years and then you have to leave unless you meet any of the other criteria to then go through the process of immigration. So there are a couple of ways that you could do it, one of which is getting married, and we were already engaged at this point. Another way is through being sponsored by your employer. Hmm. Now, my employer at the time, when I first moved to Winnipeg, I got a job working in uh, an assisted living facility, seniors retirement complex, and I loved it. Um, I think my passions in life have always been uh, the non-profit and charitable sector, uh, working with seniors and radio. And it's brilliant because getting a job at CJNU means that I actually get to work in all three at the same time. Mm -hmm. But I ticked two of the three criteria in my first job in Winnipeg. And uh, I was working at a nice place called Lindenwood, just based off uh, Keniston McGilvery. And 
honest to God, I would probably still be there now had I not been offered the job that I have now. And I really genuinely loved the job that I was doing there. So I managed to convince my then boss to sponsor me to become a Canadian permanent resident. And I think the company had to spend a whopping 400 and something dollars to uh, go through this process. And I offered to pay them back and they said, no, 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 we like you enough. We want to keep you around. Mm -hmm. So um, this obviously just meant, you know, paperwork on paperwork, patience, lots of waiting, lots and lots and lots of waiting. Um, I think at the point where I had filed my application and everything was in process. So I still had a work permit at this point. We happen to go and visit the International Peace Gardens. And when you go, you don't technically leave Canada, but you still have to go through the border crossing and you have to show your passport. So the border guard looks at my passport and he goes, oh, I see your work permit's expiring. What's the plan? I said, well, I'm going through this and I file all this paperwork. And he just said, oh, mate, I'm so sorry. And I said, what do you mean? He says, you just got to hurry up and wait, right? I said, oh, I'm glad you understand. That's really nice. He said, yeah, good luck. And I just thought, OK, that's the nicest border guard I've ever met in my life. Um, so it was it was a lot of waiting and a lot of patience. And uh, eventually in 2018, 17, 18, I honestly forget at this point now. Time has flown oh, so quickly. Time is weird these days. Yeah, time has gone. Time has gone very, very strange. It may even have been 2016. Anyway, I became a permanent resident of Canada and this was fabulous. And I could not have been more happy. And then immediately looked at how I could become a Canadian citizen. And you have to wait a certain length of time and you have to be here a certain number of days. So I waited and I waited plus one day on top of the minimum requirement and then filed all my paperwork. And when I eventually get through this process, 2018, early 2019 at this point, I, uh, I'm looking across the desk at the person who's just checked my test scores. And she says, very good. You know, you got full marks on the citizenship test. Um, I've got one note on your file here. It says that, you know, the minimum number of days that you're supposed to be here, you've only met that requirement by plus one day. You know, if you've messed this up somehow and they find out that you, you know, weren't in the country for a day, uh, they're going to throw this application out. And I said, okay, so here's a list on my phone of every single time I've been in and out of the country in the last six years, every flight number, every place I went to. She said, oh, you're one of those people. You're fine. <laughs> So I became a Canadian citizen in 2019, and I could not be more happy about that. And I am very, very glad to be here. The world is a crazy place. And people think that Winnipeg has problems, and they are right. Our city and our community has unique challenges, but it also has some very normal challenges that any major city on earth has. And I think sometimes we are a little bit too close to everything. Mm -hmm. And I try and keep a little bit of that outsider's perspective and remind myself, no, Winnipeg's actually a really bloody good place to be. And I don't want to be anywhere else right now. The world is mad. Winnipeg <laughs> has its issues, but I'd rather be here than anywhere else. And I like being a Canadian citizen because it means I now have three passports. I'm like the world's crappest super spy because all of them feature my real name. So I can't really do much of anything. Um, CJNU came into all of this right at the start. The minute I moved to Winnipeg, I started volunteering at the station. Because did you hear about it? Or how did it come up on your like how did that come across your tape? Across my your wife was a listener, and so were her parents. And I had done a little bit of online listening before I moved. Um, also, uh, being one of those people, like the nice uh, citizenship judge said to me, uh, I did my research. So when it looked like it was serious that I was going to be moving to Winnipeg, I mean, I fired my resume off to every radio station in the city, commercial, CBC. Um, I managed to get several very promising phone calls with folks in various organizations. I think I spoke to somebody who was a program director at one of the stations run by Bell. Uh, I was uh, at the CBC a couple of times and they just said, we like you. We just don't have any jobs. And that seems to be a theme in the, the media industry generally. It's that there's a lot of centralization and rationalization, which means that there are fewer positions available because a lot of things are getting done more centrally in places like Toronto or Vancouver. So I'd made these connections and that was great. But uh, no, there was there was no paid work available. So I was looking for something to do, found the job that I was working at uh, Lindenwood, but did not want to lose connection with radio. So I'd already heard about CJNU. I'd listened online. I mean, I'd already also heard about UMFM and CKUW at the U of 
uh, the U of M and the U of W, and I'd done a little bit of listening to them. But I thought to myself, CJNU seems like a good fit for me because what they do is a little bit more weighted towards music and conversation. It's a bit closer to uh, quote unquote traditional radio, but the ethos is very different to traditional radio because the way I try and describe it is commercial radio is brilliant and they do a job and they fulfill a, a niche and they can have very specific stations targeting different kinds of audiences. And, you know, the, the ultimate goal is sell adverts and make money and that's commercial radio. And then you've got the CBC and, you know, their mandate is provide a public service and they have the budget to do so. And then community radio is a little bit more plucky and uh, it's, OK, try and do everything that the other guys do, but with absolutely no money. And also all of the folks who do it are probably volunteers. We made it work and we always have. And I tip my hat to the U of W and the U of M and also the folks at CKXL, the French language community station here in Manitoba, because they all make it work as well. I think in Winnipeg, we're pretty lucky that we have such a rich community radio tapestry, because in some larger communities than us, there are fewer stations. We're very lucky that we can sort of cover a very wide gamut with the the, the four different campus or community based stations here in the city. It, it's a being sorry, Nolan, go ahead. No, I was just going to say it's the DIY mindset of like, just tape it together and put, you know, like make it work. And, and that's what you're talking about before, but like yeah. with so many vault, like with juggling so many volunteers and so many different sort of elements of, you know, this person's doing this job and this person's doing that job. And it used to be sort of like everyone's in the same room and you can look across the table. Like what were some of the struggles of going digital and being, you know, zoom chats as opposed to meeting people in the office and in the, in the studio and stuff. And like, how did that change things? I mean, especially because the technology is a hurdle for a lot of people and it, it's it's been a tough sort of transition for some people so what was that like for you and your team i think it changed the dynamic but it didn't change it in a bad way it changed it in a good way because it just meant that everyone was that bit more engaged mm. and uh, the the technology was was almost the the enabler and the facilitator through this process and we wanted it to be as unobtrusive as possible and leave the slightly more confusing bits in the hands of people who could probably troubleshoot themselves and probably understand it themselves and keep those bits away from the folks who just wanted to have fun, chat with folks, share things, share music that they love. So we, we made it work. And I would say that because of that, and when we tried to almost use a buddy system where we paired people up. So you always had somebody who knew more techie things and somebody who maybe didn't. And these pairs of folks seemed to really want to work hard to make it work. And they were willing to listen and they had the patience of many saints in making things work. And um, sure, there were technical difficulties. And I will be very honest and say that I did not sleep much in uh, the period of March to July of 2020. But once everyone was sort of into a rhythm and into a routine, it almost ran itself. And it just, it was, it was so heartening for me to see people of all sort of skills and backgrounds saying, yeah, I'll give that a go. Yeah, I'll try that. No, I, I still want to do something. No, I don't have a mic. Can you lend me one? Yeah, no, I can use my iPad. Sure. And we, we would, we would try almost anything. And that's, that's one of the best things about community radio broadly. It's, you can have an idea and within maybe sometimes a day, more likely a week, you throw several things at the wall, you see what sticks. And from, you know, spark to uh, inception could be a very brief period of time. And if it works, brilliant. Now we've got something that we can do. And if it doesn't, you say, well, great, that was fun to try. What are we going to try next? Yeah. Every day is probably different for you. Hey, that's like certain. I mean, you have the, the certain sort of days that you have things scheduled, but I mean, every day you're talking to new people, you're learning new things. You're in different parts of the community. Maybe it's, you mentioned it briefly that you were in Kildonan place or whatever, when the pandemic started, but maybe for people who don't know the business model of CJNU, how does that work when you're in, in a different place? Place every month you're broadcasting from from the community and follow-up question why is it important to do that that you know the second part of that i think is the most important and obviously i will get on to that the first part what is the model and how does it work well it was born out of necessity and then it became our thing 
Uh, at the very beginning, some folks in 1995 wanted to do a special broadcast recognizing the 75th, no, the 50th anniversary of VE Day in uh, in Europe, the uh, end of the Second World War. And it was a lot of retired broadcasters, folks like Cactus Jack Wells and Cliff Gardner and brilliant names from Winnipeg Radio yesteryear. And they all came together and they had a go at this and they got the first ever temporary broadcast permit in Canada so they could do a special event radio station. So it was on the air for, I forget how long, maybe a week or two. And they were inundated with letters from people saying, this is brilliant, you should do this again. So they did. And they kept trying to find special events to do this. And, you know, the momentum grew and eventually this group were uh, successful in applying for a commercial radio license. Unfortunately, the business model didn't quite work then. They tried very hard to make it work, but ended up having to sell to a larger commercial group. But folks who were interested in the idea of a grassroots radio station that played perhaps older music that isn't played by anyone else and also tried to focus on some of the positive things happening in our community, that idea didn't die. And so you had another group of people trying again, and there were a couple of fits and starts. But 2006 was when CJNU first went on the air. Uh, with the NU standing for Nostalgia Unlimited. I always think that was pretty cool. And they got a permit from Industry Canada saying for 28 days, you have permission to broadcast at a very low wattage for a special event. And the special event was recognizing a charity in our community. And our very, very first charity that we partnered with was uh, Winnipeg Harvest, now Harvest Manitoba. And they let a group of ragtag retired broadcasters and uh, folks with a passion for radio show up at their offices with a bunch of equipment and LPs and CDs and probably tapes at that point as well. And they just let them have fun and make some radio. And it was real, honest grassroots broadcasting. And they were interviewing all the folks at Harvest, talking to them about why it's important what they do, talking to the volunteers on the front line. Why do you get involved? What is it that... What is it that keeps you coming back? And so 28 days came and went. And in the background, they were scrabbling, trying to find another organization to work with. And I forget where exactly they went to next. But from December of 2006, they just never stopped. <laughs> and my predecessor, Bill Stewart, who was the first manager at CJNU, told me, in the early days, we genuinely did not know if this month would be the last month mm. because we were scrabbling to find another organization to host us. But relationships were built. And one of the very early relationships that we built was with the Winnipeg Foundation. And I think it was April of 2007. So very early in our first year where um, then CEO Rick Frost said, yeah, you guys can come here, take my office. And he moved all his stuff out and he went and worked in a, in a broom cupboard somewhere and gave us his corner office on the 13th floor of the Richardson building. And it was absolutely marvelous. And this model was, like I say, it was necessity. We needed a special event and we got these permits every 28 days. That was an interesting wheeze in and of itself because Bill Stewart asked the folks at Industry Canada, is there any reason why we can't keep applying for these every 28 days? And they looked at the legislation and they said, nope, go for it. So it was sort of an, a loophole to get us on the air. And we then filed paperwork to become a fully licensed station, but this time under the uh, community license that the CRTC offers, which is different to commercial radio because it says right there in the legislation, you must sound different and distinct to other broadcasters like community uh, campus, forgive me, like community, like, like commercial radio and the CBC. Right. So campus and community radio has a, an absolute requirement that you're supposed to be a bit different. Mm -hmm. So we filed this application and we were fortunate enough, 2013, we were given a full license. And at this point, technically we didn't need to keep finding a new place every month anymore. But at no point did anybody ever even think about stopping doing that because we wanted to continue to be the community station that broadcasts from in and across the community. I, I sometimes say to people, what other radio station can tell you that we get foot traffic? You know, we like to be set up somewhere that's ideally in the public eye. So being somewhere like a mall storefront is amazing because if you can have a month or two there, People just see what's going on and we invite them in and show them how radio works. And if they haven't heard the station before, we tell them about why we exist and how we do things and what our sponsor for that month is up to. It could be the Life Saving Society Manitoba. It could be uh, any charity or nonprofit. Essentially, the model dictates that our host sponsor must always be either a registered charity or a not-for-profit organization. 
And we do work with other organizations as well, but it's heavily weighted towards the charitable and nonprofit sector. And then when we do work with other businesses, we tend to try and focus heavily on small, local, independent businesses that might otherwise have no access to a platform to talk about what they do. So we work with those smaller mom and pop shops that would no way be able to afford radio advertising otherwise. And it's really rewarding working with them because then you can have honest conversations with somebody who owns a business and say, yeah, but why did you start this? What, you know, what was the niche that you were looking for? And how is it that you make sure that you still serve people? And I think most of the uh, businesses that we work with have a very, very community uh, mindset in what they do. And a lot of them are uh, supporting other charities and other causes with what they do day to day. So it, it started as, you know, looking for somewhere to put radio equipment and volunteers for 28 days. And now it's become our thing where we, within the last few years, completely rebuilt our remote studio kit. And we now have uh, four essentially carts on wheels with rack mount equipment in them. So we can just roll into the back of a van, drive off somewhere else, roll out. It's almost like the A-team, but not quite as exciting. Uh, none of us looks like B.A. Baracus, sadly. But, you know, it, it's great fun. And we still, every month of the year, work with a different organization to try and shine the spotlight primarily on them. Well, it's, it's, it's similar to what we're doing at the foundation too, in that I get to talk to people making a real difference in the world who are dedicating their lives to some of these issues and causes. And like, how does that make you feel when you get to go to a hospital and, you know, watch people dedicating their lives to solving cancer or when, you know, whatever it is, wherever you happen to be, you get the gift of being able to speak with people who are making Winnipeg a better place every single month. And it's somewhere new every single month. Like how, how would you ever get bored of that? You know? It's uh, the word I would use is humbling. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also deeply heartening. It's humbling to see how much people give of themselves to look out for others, but it's also heartening because as I had mentioned earlier, people sometimes think Winnipeg has more problems than any other city on the planet. And, oh, we're never going to get over this or, oh, we've got these insurmountable issues. But no, when you're actually talking to people on the front line in whatever field they are working in tirelessly, you very quickly realize, oh, do you know what? It's, it's not as bad as perhaps we perceive it to be. And that perception versus reality thing is huge for us. And we are constantly trying to, you know, we, we don't shy away from difficult topics of conversation. But if you're talking about a difficult topic of conversation, like, for instance, healthcare in Manitoba, I can remember sitting down and doing uh, uh, an interview with Jonathan Lyon, the CEO at the Health Sciences Centre, um, one of the first things he said to me was, you know, it doesn't matter what color of government there is, there will never be enough money for healthcare." And I looked at him and I said, you know, you're probably right. You know, you could have a 99 percent tax rate and there still wouldn't be enough money for every healthcare institution to do everything that needs to be done for every person who needs care. And that's why hospital foundations exist. And that's why organizations like Cancer Care Manitoba exist. And they're there to provide that extra level of care and that extra level of service that otherwise wouldn't be available. Mm -hmm. Is it perfect? No, of course it isn't. But I think the important thing is to acknowledge that these organizations exist to work to make things better. So we don't want to avoid talking about the difficult things, but we want to, instead of focusing on the problem, focus on the solutions that people are working really hard to implement and focus on the amazing things that people are doing to improve life. It reminds me of, I'm not sure if it's Mr. Dress Up or, or something, but it's like he teaches kids that when there's a tragedy and there's something bad happening on TV, look for the helpers because there's way more people working to solve the problem than there are people causing the problem. And, there, and, that's, what it, and that's what Winnipeg is. It's just most people are paddling the boat in the, in the direction of progress. And those are the people that we need to support and platform and talk to and learn from and, and, and hear from. But um, when you go back, when you first started at CJNU, did you have sort of a, a plan? Did you have a list of things you wanted to do? Did you have sort of a, a grand vision for the station? And how has that vision changed over the years? And what have you achieved? Or what have you, you know, like how, how 10 years ago, starting out, bring me back to then and how has your plan sort of 
changed throughout the years? That's a heck of a good question. Um, I mean, when I first started, I was a volunteer like anyone else. So I just showed up and wanted to learn the ropes and learn how to play music and do things the way that the station wanted me to. And the very first person I was paired up with was former CBC sportscaster extraordinaire, Mr. Ernie Naren. And Ernie sat down with me and very quickly realized that I liked radio and I sort of understood how the medium worked. And I think within uh, five minutes of being in a studio with him for the first time ever, he just said, you know what you're doing here, you run it. And then he went off and got himself a cup of coffee. And I just thought, uh, but you know, it wasn't my first time in a radio studio. In fairness, it was my first time with that specific layout, that specific software, that specific equipment, but I didn't do anything that set fire to something. And when he came back, he said, see, I told you, you'd be fine. So Ernie was brilliant like that. He would, if he saw skill in someone, he'd throw them in at the deep end and see if they would swim or drown. And more often than not, they would swim. And if it looked like that they were uh, starting to take on water, he would be right back in there to help. Sure. Um, so I started out just wanting to get involved. And I mean, I think I mentioned it earlier. My first paid job in Winnipeg was not in radio, and I'd probably still be working that job if I hadn't been offered the manager's position at CJNU. I'd served on the board at CJNU for about a year. And then Bill Stewart, my predecessor as manager, indicated that he was thinking about retirement for about the third time in his career. Um, and he's he a legend. Said, I, he, he's an amazing human being, an amazing human being. But he, he just said, I think you should go for this. And I said, well, I'm not sure. He says, I know nobody's ever sure, but I think you should go for it. I think you'd be a good fit. So, I mean, I gathered my thoughts and I polished up my resume and, Sure enough, I was lucky enough to be offered the position, uh, got paid absolute peanuts for it, still get paid very little. And it's one of those lovely things when you're a manager in a not for profit organization and a co-op like CJNU, you know, anybody who's a member of our co-op, if they want to, can ask to look at our financial statements. We present them every year at our annual general meeting. And I will unashamedly and unabashedly say I get paid exactly what we can afford. And uh, that makes me happy. And I think hopefully that makes the organization happy because I'm certainly nobody is ever going to be lining their pockets at CJNU. Let me put it that way. Uh, we do it because we love it. And the money that we get is reinvested right back into the organization so that we can do more to support the community. Thinking about goals and vision, um, when I was first hired, uh, Bill sat down with me at a cafe and he sort of did a, a dump of information where he just chatted about everything. And I have a notepad with reams of notes from that day. And I thought, oh, notepad, that's a good idea. So I bought myself a notebook. And now every year I have a notebook that I bring with me and it's roughly one a year that I use, but sometimes, you know, you write more or write less. I bring it to every meeting, et cetera. But that very first notebook in my very first year. So I started in the manager's chair in this, no, November of 2016. So I wrote across four pages, long-term to-do list. And it had lots of different items on it, like diversify revenue streams, because as a community broadcaster, an awful lot of the money that we make is in two big categories. One is, uh, you could say, commercial revenue, which would be working with, partnering with, uh, getting sponsorship from the big categories that we've spoken about, like charitable and not-for-profit organizations, and then smaller local businesses. But of course, part of being a community radio station and part of our mandate and our ethos is that we want to provide our platform and share our platform with as many people as possible. We don't want the barrier to entry to be high. So we don't charge very much for our advertising. You know, it's fractions of what you'd be charged in commercial broadcasting. So, you know, that brings in maybe two thirds of our revenue in a year, but it's still not a huge number. The other one third comes from roughly what we would describe as direct listener support. We're a co-op. It's open to all. It's a not for profit. There's no shares no money's being issued to anyone. $25 a year gets you membership in the co-op. That means that you get to participate in extra contests. We do prize draws for members only. You know, we try and give as many little perks to members as possible. But for your seven cents a day, essentially, it's just feeling good about supporting something you care about. Um, then we do receive donations. We can't offer a tax receipt because we're not a charity, but donations get invested straight back into the organization, just like everything else. The, the goal of a not-for-profit co-op every year is to ideally break even 
and if possible, have a small surplus and then put some in your rainy day fund and then some into your budget for next year. So that's what we've been doing year and year in, year out. But I wrote down diversify revenues and I thought to myself, well, what does that even mean? How can I, how can we achieve that? I guess that one's still on the list. We're always looking at ways that we can do things differently and be more creative. But across four pages, I kind of wish I had the notebook with me now. I had all sorts of little things like um, improve training and uh, better utilization of website and uh, get a web archive available so that people can listen again to programs that they missed and uh, strengthen partnerships with organizations so that they're not just one month in the year, they're a partnership that lasts year round because it's brilliant to have a one month spotlight, but that doesn't mean that that organization isn't doing things at other times during the year. So it's how can we do that and how can we sustain that and make sure that they are they are getting love from us and we are getting love from them and the word is getting out there. So every year I go back roughly around the same time of year to this four page list, because sometimes in the day to day grind, you can forget that progress is being made because you get very, very close to things and you think, oh, it's frustrating. I wish we were doing more. But every single year without fail, one, two, three, five things are getting crossed off this list. Mm -hmm. And suddenly now I'm in my sixth year, I guess, maybe my seventh math, mm -hmm. not a strong point right now, especially because time has been so screwy. But the list is getting shorter and shorter. I mean, my daily to do list shrinks by one and grows by five every day without fail. Mm -hmm. But the long term list, things are getting done. And I just kind of have to take a step back and have the 30,000 foot view and say, my goodness, we really are making progress. Yeah, it's great to see. And it's been fun to be sort of a small part of the CJNU family. Like we had the um, Winnipeg Foundation at a radio show for a while, and I still put some of the podcast highlights on and stuff. So thank you very much for, for the opportunity to share our stories our pleasure. Uh, on CJNU. It's, it's been so great to just see, see the progress and just be a small part of it and talk to the people and go down to the um, studio when when we were legally allowed to go out <laughs> <laughs> hopefully but soon again and, and on that point I will just say Nolan it's one of those beautiful things that very quickly after I started both as a volunteer and then eventually becoming the manager uh, I was so so impressed with the relationship that had been built between the Winnipeg Foundation and CJNU um, I think no word of a lie, you are our longest term supporter and one of our biggest supporters. And we value that relationship so hugely because mm -hmm. truthfully, we would not exist in the way that we do today. We may not exist at all without the, the vision and foresight and support of the Winnipeg Foundation. So we are blown away by that ongoing support. But more than that, I'm excited to see the way that you communicate things evolve over the years because yeah. it started as a pilot project thinking, yeah. wouldn't it be fun to try doing a 15 minute or 30 minute radio show? And then that ended up going to 45 minutes to an hour. And then it was weekly and it went weekly pretty much without interruption for, I'm going to say four or five yeah. years, then changed format slightly and changed yeah. name slightly and then spun off this podcast. And now the podcast is going from strength to strength. And I think the beautiful thing about a podcast that a lot of people seem to still have not grasped and it boggles my mind is that a good podcast is great radio and that good radio can potentially be a great podcast. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's a positive circle of reinforcement, mm -hmm. creative audio and communication, radio podcasting. It's the same thing. It's um, slightly different presentation perhaps, but it just makes me happy to see what the foundation is doing, going from strength to strength and to see the value that you place in audio because i still think of audio as this powerful uh direct means of communication yeah it feels like when before we start like maybe even 10 years ago radio was kind of like a it just seemed as though it was going it was going it was trending downward and then absolutely the, the blast of podcasts that came out is like actually this medium has some legs and uh so that being said like what's the future hold for CJ and you and for your team? And like, what, what direction are you trying to sort of steer the ship in moving forward? Um, steady maintained growth, I think is a sensible thing. You know, I, I want to be a, a firm hand on the rudder. Uh, if you'd prefer a, an agricultural <laughs> thing, uh, a firm hand on the tiller, I guess, you know, we, we want to, we don't want growth for the sake of growth is not worth it. Um, we've reached, uh, I would say we've reached a critical mass as an organization right now. 
we have over 100, maybe 120 volunteers regularly involved in the station doing something, whether it's on air, off air. Uh, they could be answering phone calls. They could be doing some uh, tech work behind the scenes. They could be writing for us. You know, we we have a newsletter that we publish monthly. We have an editor for that and somebody who does the, the layouts. We partner with uh, an organization called Senior Scope and we have a full page in their newspaper on a monthly basis. You know, ra radio isn't just radio anymore in the way that we're talking about podcasting and radio being that positive relationship. But radio is also podcasting, is also video, is also social media, is also print media. So we're trying to make sure that we keep up with that and ideally stay ahead of that. But at the core of what we do will always be 93.7 FM in Winnipeg. But it's it's fascinating because the, the line I've been using a lot recently is when you look at CJNU, we are a community organization and a not-for-profit first, and we are a radio station second. We are a community nonprofit whose main goal is to amplify the work of others and shine the light on others and talk about how good they are. And we want to be a hub and we want to be a connecting point. And we also want to provide a service like a public service. And we want to you know, a lot of what we do is music on the air, of course, and we want to play the music that nobody else is playing. We want to share the passion about that music. It's just that the method by which we do it happens to be predominantly radio. And that's cool. But trying to get other people to wrap their head around that is sometimes difficult because people have a preconceived notion about what radio is, you know, and you might walk into the office of an organization and explain what you do. And they say, oh, yeah, no, we work with this media organization and this media organization, and this is how we buy and this is how we do that. And we're thinking kind of forget that we're a radio station think about partnering with another nonprofit in terms of doing creative projects and how you might do community outreach and grassroots stuff now add in the fact that one of the ways that we can do that for you happens to be radio so we're, we're trying to sort of shift the emphasis in that regard and make sure that people understand that radio might change over time but the core goals of the organization will never change we want to be there to essentially big up other people and other organizations that are doing amazing things and play brilliant music and give volunteers and passionate people an opportunity to share their passions with others so i mean what does that mean it, it means that we're trying to keep pace with tech you know a lot of people listen online and we try to make sure that our stream is robust and available everywhere we have listeners all over the world who get in touch with us regularly, which is mind blowing sometimes, but we're always going to be Winnipeg focused because this is the community that uh, we serve. So I would, I would like to see slow, steady growth right now. I am one of two full-time paid staff. Maybe at some point in the future, we might be able to hire someone else who knows, mm -hmm. but you know, we, we have this brilliant model where volunteers are involved in literally every aspect of our operation and the staff that we have and the couple of people who work for us on a contract basis, we all have a relatively tight focus in what our primary goals are, but it's very collegial and very collaborative in what we do. And I think that's one of our strengths is that ability to try anything and everybody helps everyone. It doesn't matter what the thing might be. If so, Somebody phones in sick and you need somebody to cover a show tomorrow. Well, if I'm already at the office, sure, I'll pop into the studio for a couple of hours. Uh, somebody needs help writing something. Oh, well, another one of our volunteers is great at that. Here, they'll, they'll help you with that. So it's, it's very, very, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's just very positive in every aspect of what we do. I think positivity is one of our core values, and we try and bring that in everything that we do. It's authentic authenticity and community married in an absolutely beautiful way. Every time I've spent any time with anyone from CJNU, it's always been smiles on the faces, having a good time, you know, enjoying ourselves. And, and it's absolutely. a beautiful thing. I know you got to go it pretty soon. So we'll skip to the uh, just because segment. It's the same seven questions I ask all the guests at the end of the podcast, all about the causes that you care about and the effect that it's had on your life. You okay to go through that? Let's do it. All right. Go down memory lane. Question one, what is the very first cause you ever remember caring about? It's a really good question. And I thought about this a lot. I think that the first cause I remember being aware of was kind of like these charity telethons that were often on TV when I was a kid. 
uh, many of them were very UK specific. There was a charity called Children in Need. And the idea was that every year they'd do an annual telethon. Uh, loads of TV shows from different networks would all get involved and they'd record special little episodes and skits and things like that. I mean, I'm sure people in North America may be familiar with things like the Jerry Lewis telethon and things back in the day. Similar vibe, but a bit more fun and engaged. And then there was an all, another charity doing a similar thing, but heavily focused towards comedy called Comic Relief. And mm. it was raising funds for uh, developing nations, especially uh, African nations. And so I remember a lot of that as a kid and thinking, this is good. This yeah. is good. We should always try and support people who need help. So I think that's probably the first thing that got me into awareness of the charitable world. Beautiful. So question two, if politics and money and logistics were no issue, you could just snap your fingers and something would happen in support of, you know, CGNU or, or community radio or however you want to consider your current cause, what would you do if you could just make something happen at the drop of a hat? Oof. Uh, being selfish, I would love if community radio as a concept in Canada could just have core stable funding. Mm. Uh, rather than having to chase every dollar, it would be amazing if there was a way to have core stable funding. We can apply for grants, but a relatively limited number because we're not charitable. That's there, There's one. If politics was uh, no, no uh, sort of inhibitor, it would be amazing if the law could be changed to recognize radio as being a charitable objective. Many nations have done this. Canada just hasn't yet. Um, if I'm being more broad, though, I would just love for more people to get involved in their community because that's the thing that's most important. Yeah, I have my my cause that I care about. I love what I do at CJNU, but I mainly love what I do at CJNU because a huge part of it is being able to give back to others. So I would just like to see more grassroots involvement in anything and everything. Um, pandemic, especially uh, a line that I found myself thinking a lot was, you know, now more than ever is the time to support the causes that mean the most to you, whatever they may be. If we happen to be one of them, brilliant. But if it's not, and this is the message that gets into your ear that makes you think, mm, I should give something to uh, St. Boniface Hospital. Brilliant. Or mm, I should really give something to uh, Stroke Recovery Association of Manitoba. Fantastic. Or smart way to invest your donating dollars. I should give something to the Winnipeg Foundation who are going to endow that and make sure it gives back to the community literally in perpetuity. Do Great. it. It's stay connected to, you know, like that the pandemic has really shown how fractured and splintered community can get if you don't make the effort to show up and look people in the eye and, you know, yeah. So I'm, I think that's a beautiful message. I love that. Um, question three, what's the biggest misunderstanding or the biggest stigma about, let's say radio that you uh, come across? Uh, people think it's a dead medium. We were we were flirting around that. You know, you said 10, 15 years ago, people were thinking radio was gone. OK, uh, 50 years ago, people were thinking that radio was gone. Uh, about 90 years ago, people were thinking that radio was gone. It, it's it's almost like the cockroach of media. You cannot kill it. Um, people have a lot of preconceived notions about what radio is. And I don't blame them because if the only diet of radio that they've ever consumed is largely commercial radio and maybe public radio, then maybe they have an idea of what that is. And I'm not, in no way am I trying to say that I don't like commercial or public radio. I really do. One of my favorite things in the world to do is sit in my car and dial surf and see what everyone else is doing. But I think that people, people should be open-minded when it comes to the concept of community radio, campus radio, this sort of grassroots movement, because Again, the emphasis is less on the medium and more on what we're using it for. The connection. Yeah, very well said. Question four, what's a recent victory, either personally or professionally, that you can share with us today? Well, I guess we touched upon it earlier, but I still think one of the things that I am most proud of is that in two plus years of pandemic, we only lost six hours of regularly That's scheduled insane. programming. That's insane. I, my mind is boggled, especially because I do know people who work in other aspects of radio and media and, you know, they, some cases lost more. Oh, it was layoff and central. Yeah. For, yeah. Trying to, trying to turn on a dime is something that we're very good at, at uh, CJNU particularly. And I think in community radio broadly. And uh, at the time the pandemic started, I served on the board of the national campus community radio association. So I was sort of helping 
lots of stations giving them ideas and saying, here, try this, try that. Don't take no for an answer. Just keep going, keep going, push through. So I am very, very proud that our immensely passionate team of volunteers we refused to take no for an answer and wanted to keep having fun and doing something unique. There's going to be books written about this time. So keep those notebooks and, uh, you know, people are going to look back on this, on this era or however you want to call it. And we're going to learn a lot. And I'm sure there's lots of things that we wish we knew now that we didn't know two and a half years ago, but absolutely. Uh, yeah, no hats off to you guys for, for keeping it, keeping the, keeping the wheels running. Like it's, it's, Absolutely nuts. Um, question five, what's the best advice that you've ever been given? Uh, best advice I was ever given in a radio studio was uh, if in doubt, shut up and play the music. Um, that doesn't work if you don't work in a music radio station. It also isn't something that you can't apply to everything in life. Um, I would say you can kind of extrapolate that a little bit, though, and say, if in doubt, stop talking and listen. And I think that's something that a lot of us need to carry with us as we move into this brave new world post pandemic. And you touched upon it, Nolan, you know, we, we need to communicate better and there is, there is more that unites us than separates us. And I think the past decade, we have found ourselves moving further and further apart. And it's, it's frustrating at times when you see two groups of people, and you might be friends with both of these groups of people. And it's like, okay, they're not saying what you think they're saying. And they're not saying what you think they're saying. You're actually both on the same page. You might not be on the same line, but you're on the same page. If you would just actually sit down and listen, you might be able to figure something out here. And I've been through a few of these sort of experiences personally, professionally, and just that ability to listen and Compromise is not a dirty word. Compromise is a good thing. And it's the way forward and it's the way that we get things done. Yes, there will be certain issues that I think every human being will say, I'm going to plant my flag on this hill and this is the hill upon which I shall die. But what I have learned as time has gone on is that there are fewer and fewer of those issues for me because compromise is the way forward. Could not agree more. Yeah, community and communication, it all starts with the same commune you know like let's all get down on the commune and treat canada like one team like we're let's all be together let's be on the same team that's such a good answer i love it thank you uh question six what would you give what advice would you give your 10 year old self if you could go back in time and uh talk to him uh don't be pushed into thinking that a degree in the humanities <laughs> is the best possible thing we call uh, that a callback we call that a callback. that would be amazing um uh, no it but Don't you wouldn't worry. have you wouldn't have gotten where you are if not for those experiences. Oh, I, I, I absolutely I look back. I think everybody can quite rightly look back at their own life and look at certain key moments that would have been turning points and think, good Lord, what would it have been like if it had gone the other way? But you don't know. And any life is just uh, uh, an accumulation of all of the things that have come before. So, yeah, I mean, I, I still... I still would have told my 10 year old self that don't don't necessarily be so strongly pushed by what others think you should do, perhaps. Mm. Um, also, maybe don't worry as much because I don't know, I was I was a kid that worried about lots of things. But now you have the uh, now you're one of those people that f fills things out a day after, you know, like that's from the worry. It's like, well, I got to get it done today. Right. I guess I'm channeling the worry into to positive into things. productivity. <laughs> <laughs> hey. That's the way to live. Thank you, Adam. You're, you're amazing. I always love hearing you. I like hearing you interview people too. Like anytime you sat down with Rick or any, like anyone from the foundation, you always ask very poignant questions. You listen, you are an active listener and that makes a great interviewer. Uh, are you still, per, are you um, on the air? You, like you're doing the community news thing? Or yeah, like, so, give, give me a little so, promo of when people can hear your beautiful voice on 93.7 CJNU. Well, I don't know about beautiful. Um, the goal of any interviewer should be almost to be like wallpaper. You're there to just facilitate and hopefully get the best out of your guest. And it's one of the reasons I like chatting with you, Nolan, because I think you're very good at that. Um, for me, if I'm doing my job properly, then I am making somebody else feel comfortable and making them willing to talk about anything. And we, we often say at CJNU, we don't do interviews. We have conversations. We don't want to be interrogative. We don't want to be aggressive. We just want to sit down and 
enjoy a chat with someone over a virtual cup of coffee. And hopefully the listener is like the third person at the cafe table with you sipping on their latte. And if I'm doing my job right, I'm hopefully thinking of the questions that they would ask if they were able to ask them. In terms of when I'm on, I mean, I pop up hither and thither as need be, but regularly Friday afternoons at noon, I host a program called the Community Cafe. And that's a program that started during the pandemic. And actually, in fairness, that's something I'm quite proud of. We've managed Mm. to keep a show that started during the pandemic entirely virtually going for two whole years. Uh, In partnership with the Winnipeg Free Press and CanStar Community News, the publishers of the uh, Free Press Community Review, the local community newspapers. Each week, I get a chance to sit down with a journalist from one of those great organizations and chat with them about the stories that they're covering, but also about the the world of news itself and the medium and sometimes talk about how it's interesting trying to cover things as a newspaper and talking about the evolution of the more multimedia nature of everything. But it's it's a really, really nice way, certainly, I think, to uh, get a little bit closer to some of the things that are happening in our community and sometimes beyond as well. Um, we also have the amazing Gary Moyer as part of that program. Uh, Gary, another former CBCer, uh, he looks at some interesting news stories from yesteryear and digs out from his own personal archive copies of, you know, the Winnipeg Tribune from this day, 1976, and looks uh-huh. at what was making the headlines. I just, my mind is blown whenever I see these sorts of things. But uh, yeah, so weekly on Fridays at noon, I uh, I sit down and chat with someone in our community cafe. We're very lucky to get to get to be able to do what we do and talk to the people that we get to talk to and interview. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Uh, I didn't ask you the last question. So before we go, the question seven is, uh, what do you want to be remembered for? Oh, um, I'd be more than happy to be quietly forgotten. But if anybody wants to remember me for anything, hopefully it's for being kind. I I would just hope that people think of me as somebody who cares about others and wants what's best for them and wants to facilitate for other people. I think if I'm doing my, it goes back to that sort of, I always try and be pragmatic in everything I do. I'm not an optimist. I'm not a pessimist. I'm a pragmatist. It doesn't matter what the problem is. There's always a solution. So I hope that people will remember me as the guy who always tried to make it work and always tried to do something right by someone else. Being kind. Bravo. Adam Glenn, station manager at CJNU 93.7 CJNU FM in Winnipeg or CJNU.ca if you're not in Winnipeg. Give it a listen. It's always good. There's always something good on CJNU. Thanks for being here today. Appreciate your time, sir. Thank you, Nolan. Thank you for everything you do.